The purpose of this screencast, pragmatically, is to review lots and lots of vocabulary words and important concepts throughout our chemistry book and throughout the chemistry course. Specifically, it's to look at the main group elements. You should know what the main group elements are. In other words, this does not include the transition metals. That would be in the next chapter. We'll, we'll be starting at the left-hand column and working our way to the inert gases in the right-hand column. But another purpose of this chapter, I think, is again to review the incredible diversity of elements, how they have such vastly different properties, which means they can be put to vastly different uses and purposes. And we think we have all kinds of uses and purposes for these elements now when we put them together in different combinations. And of course, it's a very, very small percentage of the combinations that are possible. After all, how many combinations of all of the different elements do you think there might be? We come up with millions of compounds, um, hundreds of thousands every year, and there's no end in sight. And you can see that God has given us a huge universe of resources and all the necessary tools and building blocks and examples in his creation to do all kinds of amazing things. There's plenty of work for you to do if you go on into science. So, one of the things that any chemistry student ought to know is a little bit about the composition of their universe, the composition of the solar system, the composition of the Earth's crust, and the composition of the Earth itself. As you can imagine, since most of what we know about the universe, and here I am not counting or including dark energy and dark matter, we know that most of the matter in the universe is tied up in stars. And stars are primarily fusing hydrogen into helium. So we would expect hydrogen and helium to be the two elements in greatest abundance in the universe. But when we look at the solar system, like on this page, Please notice, sorry about this, it's, my screen doesn't, it doesn't like what I'm doing. Please notice that the y-axis is a logarithmic scale. Each unit is actually a factor of 100. So, for example, if you look at the number of atoms of hydrogen and compare it to helium, a quick glance at the graph makes you think like helium almost has as much as hydrogen in terms of the number of atoms. When in fact, a careful look using that y-axis is that there are at least 10 times as many hydrogen atoms as helium atoms. <clears throat> Notice another thing. It drops precipitously when we get to lithium and beryllium and boron. And so, evidently, whatever processes by which elements are formed in <clears throat> outer space and in the nebula and gas clouds that surround stars and former stars, it must be difficult for lithium and beryllium to form, whereas it must be a lot easier for carbon and nitrogen and oxygen to form because they're in much greater abundance. So, it's not like we're just smashing a hydrogen into the Next element up, and two hydrogens gives us helium. Smash a hydrogen into helium, you get lithium. Smash a hydrogen into lithium, you get beryllium. Evidently, that's not what's going on. In fact, we think that carbon is formed when you get three helium particles that strike each other. And if you think about it, when we had our unit on kinetics and mechanism, what is the likelihood of three particles? hitting each other at exactly the same time in right orientation in space. It's very, very unlikely. And yet, that's our theory behind the formation of carbon, because <clears throat> we have an abundance of carbon. 
we call the formation of these bigger elements from the smaller elements nuclear synthesis. Now let's look at the Earth's crust. Notice that the, in the Earth's crust, hydrogen drops from number one in the solar system to number 10. And in the Earth's crust, oxygen and silicon go right to the top. So we have lots of oxygen, and of course, a lot of that is in water, and some of that is in atmospheric oxygen. And just about all the minerals in the Earth's crust have oxygen in them. Silicon is number two, and again, just about all the minerals and the rocks in the Earth's crust have silicon in them. And it might surprise you that aluminum is element number three. And you might say, well, why is aluminum recycled if we have so much of it? It's the third most abundant. Well, of course, aluminum is very, very expensive to extract from the Earth's crust to separate it from the other elements that it's connected to in the ores, O-R-E, the, um, the minerals that contain the aluminum. And so it still is cheaper to, once you make the aluminum, just to recycle it and use it over. And for that matter, if you think about it, whether something is expensive or cheap, abundant or not, we should wisely dispose of things and we should use them um, over and over if it's convenient and, e and relatively um, easy and efficient to do so. Now, another thing you know about this periodic table is it's set up so that as you go from left to right, each column, you are adding one more atom, but also one more electron to the outer shell. Also, you know that all the elements on the left side and in the middle of the periodic table, the transition metals, are indeed just that. They are metals. They have a metallic character. They like to lose electrons. They like to form ionic bonds. The nonmetals, by their very name, don't have metallic properties. They don't like to lose electrons, which is an explanation for many of the metallic properties, like shininess and the ability to conduct electricity and heat. But rather, the nonmetals want an electron, and they have a tendency to form covalent bonds. Now, it's the electrons in the outer shell that are most important. Those are the ones that are involved in chemistry. So when we say NS and NP, N is the principal quantum number, energy level number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's N, and S and P refer to the subshells. So we're looking at the S subshell electrons, which are the, in the first two columns, and the 6P subshell electrons, which are in the last six columns on the periodic table. <clears throat> Those are the valence electrons, a word you should be very comfortable with. We also know that the elements in the very right side are noble gases. They seem to have this octet, which makes them non-reactive. But elements like to attain a noble gas configuration, which means they like to end up with eight electrons. That's a very stable configuration for your valence shell, to have a total of eight electrons. And so you either lose one or more electrons and fall back or end up with eight from the previous energy level, or you gain electrons in order to end up with or acquire a total of eight in the outer shell. And so elements create bonds with other elements <clears throat> such that the number of electrons that are gained or lost enables each element to have this noble gas configuration. That's a general trend or pattern and the explanation for the stability of those eight electrons was that would be four orbitals, the S, the PX, the PY, and the PZ, with two electrons in each orbital, and hybridized. So you can't tell an S from a P. All four orbitals would have a maximum of two electrons as long as those two electrons have the opposite spin to overcome their repulsion. <clears throat> and we learned how to write formulas for compounds based upon that. We also can create molecular compounds of these main group elements as well, especially from the right side of the periodic table. And we're trying to 
go quickly here. I'll let you pause and look at those boxes if you have the time for um, practice and review. Now let's look at the element number one and the head of the left-hand column on the periodic table, hydrogen. We have three main isotopes of hydrogen. The hyd hydrogen isotope with no protons, excuse me, no neutrons, is protium. Protium, a common word that means one, or beginning, or prototype, for example, the first rendition. Then we have hydrogen two, deuterium. Du deuto it often means two. And this is one proton plus one neutron. And then tritium, the third isotope, has three nucleons, one proton and two neutrons. And you can make all the compounds that you make out of hydrogen, such as water and ammonia. You can also make using um, not just protium, but deuterium and tritium as well. Tritium of these three is radioactive. It, it is unstable. Uh, it has a half-life of a little over 12 years. Hydrogen being less dense than air. If you fill up a container with that and the container is not made out of heavy material, you can get something that will float in the air. And here you have a story of the Graf Zeppelin and the Hindenburg. Two German names. Because in between World War I and World War II, they were really moving rapidly in terms of lots of technologies. And you can see the Hindenburg disaster. Now, if you make water out of deuterium instead of protium hydrogens, you have what we call heavy water because each of your hydrogens has an additional neutron. And heavy water has all kinds of uses, like we talked about in nuclear chemistry. Um, being heavier, meaning denser, it can absorb neutrons <clears throat> or slow them down, I should say, better than ordinary water can. But heavy water, D2O instead of H2O, is a natural um, small percentage ingredient in the composition of water. <clears throat> now, another compound category that you should know, in case they throw it at you on the AP, would be a metallic hydride. Remember the oxidation numbers? Hydrogen is always plus one. But then you've got this exception, hydrogen is a minus one when it's with an, a metal. Metals are more metallic than hydrogen are because they're below on the periodic table. Remember, your most metallic of metals are bottom left. Your least metallics are the upper right, which would be fluorine, not counting the inert gases. So your metal hydrides would be the metal as the positive ion and the hydrogen as the negative one. We also make lots of molecular compounds, as we mentioned before, with hydrogen. Now, hi, um, hydrogen compounds are kind of interesting. They mention at the top of the page here, interstitial hydrides. So a lot of metallic hydrides have these spaces between the crystalline structure of the metals. And in these spaces, sometimes, you can absorb stuff. Stuff can get in between the spaces in the crystalline structure. These spaces, this is what the word interstitial mean. And you can use them, actually, to store hydrogen gas. If you want to read an interesting um, historical note, um, cold fusion a number of years ago was believed to be occurring when hydrogen was being trapped in the interstitial spaces of certain electrodes and fusing together to create huge amounts of energy, but at a low temperature. And people were all excited that maybe we could get the fusion energy at cold temperatures rather than the extremely difficult and expensive high temperatures that stars do it. And that proved to be a bust, though I think in Japan they're still looking into it. Cold fusion. 
How can you get hydrogen? Well, you're going to see electrolysis play a role frequently. We had that chapter a couple weeks ago, uh, passing electricity through water or passing electricity through a molten salt to get the pure elements. There's another example here besides um, electrolysis, and that's the catalytic steam reformation of hydrocarbons. What that means is if you have the right catalyst and you have the right temperature, which would be necessary for water to be steam, you can take methane and steam and produce a mixture of hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide gas, sometimes called water gas or synthogas. <clears throat> Alkali metals. These would be the elements right underneath hydrogen on the left side of the periodic table. And you might remember in first year chemistry, I threw some metals into water and they blew up from this first column, sodium and potassium. We even watched a video of the metals farther on down, the alkali metals, that really made huge dangerous explosions. You did a lab with some alkali earth metals in the second column. Um, so you, you knew about this. You also know that you could make hydrogen by combining acid with a metal, and the metal would re replace the hydrogen in the acid. Calcium hydride re reacting with water is an example given to you at the bottom of the right-hand page. And, of course, when you're creating gases, you can go from just simple bubbling to really, really fizzing to a very, very violent reaction as the gas escapes. Other importance of these alkali metals is how much they are necessary in um, nature. Sometimes um, farmers will put, will put out a big block of salt called a salt lick. You can see some cows there to get some minerals in their diet. Sometimes hunters might put a block of salt out and wait for the deer to come out and lick the salt. Um, maybe that's not fair to the deer or if you're, if you're the hunter. The Roman soldiers were actually paid in salt. And that word salt money in Latin is what we get the word salary from. Sometimes you can make sodium and potassium um, through various kinds of chemical reactions that we've known about for 200 years. You might remember that Sir Humphrey Davy was one of the people that sort of trained Michael Faraday. And uh, in preparing sodium and potassium, you can see why they would not exist naturally in nature, because pure sodium and potassium are extremely reactive with water. And there aren't too many places in the Earth's crust where there's absolutely no water at all, or any moisture or humidity. Fortunately, on the AP test, you won't have to know too much about some of these industrial processes, like the Downs cell for preparing sodium. <clears throat> but if you think about it, if you're going to be separating sodium from chlorine in sodium chloride table salt, you better have a safe way to store that sodium so it doesn't come in contact with any type of water and a safe way to store that chlorine so that no one is going to come in contact with it. They're valuable elements, but they're very, very dangerous. Now, I've highlighted in here the interesting phenomenon that back to oxidation numbers, sometimes oxygen is not a minus two oxidation number. Sometimes oxygen is a minus one. And that is true in peroxides. If you look at the formula for sodium peroxide, Na2O2, right here, <clears throat> if each sodium is a plus one, then each oxygen has to be a minus one. Not only that, but you can have a superoxide. And in a superoxide, like this potassium oxide right here, if potassium is a plus one, then each oxygen has to be a negative one-half. Very weird. And it reminds you that oxidation numbers are inventions, 
not something that is real in uh, creation. <clears throat> they serve a purpose. <clears throat> you should know that alkali metals are really good reducing agents. Remember what a reducing agent does. A reducing agent helps something to be reduced. What does reducing mean? To be reduced means to gain electrons. So if you are a reducing agent, you have to help some other element gain electrons, which means you have to be the source of that electron. And metals have one or two electrons in the outer shell that they'd like to get rid of. So metals are good sources of electrons, so they are good reducing agents. Those are important vocabulary words to review. Here's some more very famous processes. You remember the electrolysis of brine? Brine is kind of a concentrated salt water. We talked about the electrolysis of potassium iodide. They mentioned the Solvay process, another famous process, which we're not going to talk about. But if you are going to go into industrial chemistry or chemical engineering, you might find yourself working for a company that uses one of these processes. Here is saltpeter. I should mention that an awful lot of these salts aren't very far down in the Earth's crust. And many of these salts have been concentrated in huge, huge, huge deposits, probably at a time when this section of the Earth's crust was covered in water. And all of the minerals and so forth settled out as the water evaporated or moved elsewhere. Saltpeter is a common name for a nitrate, either sodium or potassium nitrate, depending upon where it's coming from. And nitrates are often used in fertilizers, but nitrates can also be used in explosives. And at one time, um, during the World Wars early on, when Germany was running out of materials out of which to make explosives, we blockaded all of their ships that were bringing in saltpeter night and these types of nitrates from South America um, across the Atlantic Ocean. And that supply was cut off and Germany had to resolve, resort to other methods uh, such as trying to um, make ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen. If you remember that reaction. Fritz Haber. Nowadays, lithium, of course, has seen huge increases in use because of our lithium-ion batteries. Alkali earth metals, the second column. You did a lab with these, and you saw that they make base solutions. They make basic solutions in water, and your phenolphthalein would turn pink, if you remember. I don't know if you've ever been to Limestone, excuse me, if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon and seen all of their limestone. Uh, I can remember my first trip to the Grand Canyon, driving across this flat land, lots of pine trees, pretty dry. And then it says, welcome to the Grand Canyon. We were coming in on the North Rim, which is much less popular than the South Rim. And, uh, so, and there wasn't much to do about entering the park. And then, the, then it said, uh, park right here and, and overlook straight ahead. So you parked your car and you walked maybe, it seemed to me like 20 feet through a few pine trees and all of a sudden, boom, 5,000 feet straight down. Uh, that was the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And so that's what kind of incredible geological processes created this Grand Canyon. Um, some gigantic earthquake or plate tectonic movement maybe ripping the earth, earth apart and then water continuing to carve out the bottom of it from then on as it uh, sought the, you know, went downhill. Uh, what a magnificent sight. I've been to both rims and it still, it just takes your breath away. You can talk about here how you would get your pure magnesium and your other earth metals. <clears throat> and of course, again, remember, since metals are highly reactive, you usually are going to find them as various uh, mineral deposits. And so it's going to take chemistry to extract 
the pure metal from the ore that it's a part of. So if you think of the oxidation numbers in the Earth's crust, the metal will have lost its electrons to the thing that it's bound with. So the metal will have a positive oxidation number. When you implement your chemistry to create the pure metal, to refine it, now you have a metal whose oxidation number is zero. So if you're going from a positive number to zero, obviously you're being reduced. And so you need a reducing agent to help you to do that. In the Earth's crust, all of your metals have already been oxidized. If not with oxygen, then something else like sulfur. <clears throat> Here are some things that farmers would know about. Lime, otherwise known as calcium oxide, having nothing to do with the fruit called a lime. Calcium oxide is often used to sweeten the soil. When we say sweeten the soil, that means if the soil um, is just not, is, is really acidic, you can make it a little bit more neutral by putting some lime or ground limestone on it. And I've done that before. You take your soil sample uh, to a local laboratory, often run by the state for this very purpose, and you learn a little bit about the composition of your soil and they'll tell you, well, your soil needs um, some mulch or manure, or your soil needs some lime, or your soil needs some more sand, or that they'll tell you a little bit about what you need to do to your soil based upon what your purpose is for your soil. What do you want to grow in your soil? And of course, cement or concrete or mortar has lime in it, as well as sand and other and water. I don't know if you've ever made mortar or concrete or cement before. I've done it. It's kind of fun to work with it and uh, pour a footing or a foundation or, you know, a base for when you're putting your mailbox in or to repair a sidewalk or something. But this is an art working with concrete. The Romans mastered it 2,000 years ago and made these huge roadways many of which are still present today, um, and many other structures. Uh, so they were masters at that. My brother has his specialty in the uh, man use of concrete to slow down and block the movement of chemical and nuclear waste material through um, uh, the, uh, the, the Earth's crust. <clears throat> This section here contains some vocabulary words you should know. Hard water. Hard water, this is not a reference to ice. That's a joke. Hard water means water that has lots of minerals in it. And these minerals would precipitate out clogging plight, uh, pipes or making ring around the bathtub or putting scum on dishes or kind of a scum left behind like a powder on your clothing. It's hard to clean in water with a high mineral content. And it makes things not taste so good. So the water needs to be softened, which makes sense. If you're going to call mineral heavy water hard, then you're going to make it soft when you get rid of the minerals. And so you would have a water softener, which means you'd have a <clears throat> way of removing the minerals from the water. <clears throat> so you're working with pretty much pure water. We, have to, we soften our water for our chemistry experiments in the lab. We have an ion exchange purification system. That's mentioned over here. And in this purification system, which is in a storage room right next to the middle biology lab, we have uh, a filtration system that brings in water. And our water is already very, very good in the school. It's already pre-treated. And then, um, so it doesn't, produce scale and begin to clog up pipes and produce all kinds of scum at the water fountains and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and But we pass it through our purification system, ion exchange, and as a result, we um, get, it, we don't use distilled water per se. We call it distilled water, but it's actually deionized water. 
as distilled water is where you boil the water away and then you've got to condense the water. That's how you separate it from any minerals. Well, in the ion exchange resin, you separate the, the minerals as the water goes through the resin. Minerals stay behind and then use that water for our experiments in chemistry. They also mentioned two other words down here, zeolites and aluminosilicate minerals, which are often ring structures. If you look where I just highlighted, naturally occurring ring structures. <clears throat> and one of the things I had to do in Idaho, probably the, one of the things I did almost more than anything else was to study aluminosilicates, study all the different ways that aluminum and silicon make up the backbone, the infrastructure, the scaffold of dirt and rocks. Because if you want to know if chemicals are on the surface of something, you better know what that surface looks like. And so I sort of became like an expert in recognizing what peaks in my mass spectrometer were aluminosilicates. So once I knew what the background would look like, I would get used to the peaks that I would see all the time because they would be various combinations of aluminosilicates. And then when I saw a peak that I'd never seen before, I could reasonably assume that this was a contaminant. This was something that was on that soil or on that surface. Now we come up to column three, where we have aluminum. And it's the third most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And we depend upon aluminum an awful lot, of course. We have boron right underneath it. You'll notice that borax, a common name for this particular boron compound. We dig it out of the ground in huge quantities in the Mojave Desert in a town appropriately entitled Boron, California. Remember, you're on the other side of the state from the ocean, so this is not going to be highly populated. Notice that it's a decahydrate, 10 waters. Here's a vocabulary word you should know, allotropes. An allotrope would be a different form of the same compound. And it's, uh, and I shouldn't say compound, of the same element, a different form. And we talk about carbon being graphite, which is sheets of carbon atoms connected horizontally. We talked about carbon as being like soot, where you hardly have any connections horizontally or vertically. And we talked about carbon in the form of diamonds, which would have bonds in all three dimensions. <clears throat> The point being that these would be three allotropes of carbon. And of course, we've known this for some time, and a little more recently, we've discovered buckyballs, and we've found carbon um, spheres and carbon tubes. Uh, all of these would be allotropes of pure carbon. Well, other elements have allotropes as well. That's a word you should be able to recognize. And here you have the idea of boron being in this form of a icosahedron. You recognize the word hedron as being a side, and icosa would be the prefix of 12 sides in this um, crystalline structure of pure boron. And they mention the history, which goes back 200 years. <coughs> Now, this rather young-looking person, Charles Martin Hall, was actually quite young uh, when he be became famous for some of the things that he was able to accomplish. 22 years old when he came up with the process for extracting aluminum. So aluminum went from seeing, being something extraordinarily expensive that you would put on display at a museum or at the World's Fair to something that we use all the time in all kinds of ways. Of course, you've got to mine the aluminum in the first place. And when you mine aluminum, one of the common minerals and we, that we find it in huge quantities is right here, bauxite. 
though a lot of our aluminum comes from overseas, like South Africa. And this process, one of the processes where that we use this is called the Bayer process, another famous name in chemistry, um, from which we also get Bayer aspirin. Now, amphoteric, that's another vocabulary word. And amphoteric um, is a substance that can be basic or acidic in nature. It's an oxide that can either act as an acid or act as a base. Now, it's different from the word amphiprotic. Amphiprotic is a substance that can gain or lose a proton. So we can act as an acid or a base. All amphiprotic substances, and water and ammonia are amphiprotic, are amphoteric. To be amphiprotic is a subset of amphoteric because you can have certain oxides without gaining or losing protons that can behave as an acid or a base depending upon what you mix them with. And you can see examples there with aluminum oxide and silicon oxide. So we're not going to talk too much more about boron, though there is an interesting structure down here at the bottom, diborane, which I see pops up periodically um, in a research article, and I think I've seen it on an AP test before. But they would give you the formula. You wouldn't be expected to memorize that. We mentioned the fact that we like aluminum because when aluminum oxidizes, creating aluminum oxide, the aluminum oxide stays put. It doesn't flake off like iron oxide flakes off of iron. When oxygen reacts with iron, or we should say when iron oxidizes, the rust that it forms falls off, exposing the fresh iron, the next level of iron, to the oxygen in the air. Pretty soon it's rusted all the way through. Aluminum doesn't do that. Once you get that aluminum oxide coating, it stays put, and no more aluminum is affected. But you can certainly react it with other things. In fact, some of our minerals and crystals, they're the beauty uh, in the, from, of the color that they have is because of various contaminants, if you want to call them contaminants, in the alumino-crystalline structure or in the overall crystalline structure. Um, some of these transition metals and aluminum can give it a color, and the color can add to its, um, its value. Now, carbon and silicon, column four. Carbon is the basis of organic chemistry. Silicon is the basis of um, earth science in terms of the earth's crust and geology and talking about minerals. But silicon now is also the central ingredient in the, in the computer chips, in all of our uh, electronic devices which have computer chips. Please make sure you know that there's a difference between the element silicon and a compound called silicone. And here you have another one, silica sand. Silica sand is simply silicon oxide. Sand is primarily made out of silicon and oxygen. And of course, we use this to make glass. Glass is made out of silicon oxide. I think the most spectacular display of making glass was on an island that I happened to have a chance to visit with my wife and my sister and her husband. Um, off the coast of Venice, um, Murano, where they're famous for making glass. I should say famous for making things out of glass and glass blowing. And some of the things on display there were worth thousands of dollars. I think my wife and I bought a postcard. <clears throat> so, silicon dioxide, also known as silica, is a network solid. Remember, you can have all kinds of solids that are network solids, making them very, very hard. Aluminosilicates make network solids. Carbon can make network solids. <clears throat> so 
Some substances made with silicon, like sodium silicate, can absorb 40% of their own weight in water. So if you would use little packets of this to uh, um, put in a medicine container or an electronic device so that no corrosion would happen to your uh, electronic device in, in shipping and in storage, and so that no moisture would destroy your medicines in, the, in a medicine container. If you look in most containers of medicine, um, maybe I don't know so much about vitamins, but certainly about aspirin and Tylenol and things like that, they often have a little packet of a silica gel. Don't swallow it. Portland cement is a very special kind of cement. And, um, of course, think about all the uses we make for scent, for cement. Here's another form of silicon with its uh, four-sided tetrahedral put in big long chains. I encountered a lot of these tetrahedra as I was trying to elucidate or determine what physical structure was represented by the spike that I saw on the mass spectrum from my mass spectrometer. Always had to account for all those different spikes. What, what would they be? What could they be? More talk about aluminosilicates. Uh, clays can be used in medicine. Clays can be used to uh, provide um, minerals in diets. One of my most memorable experiences in all my years of teaching was when the school gave me a week off to, well, actually 10 days off to travel down to eastern Peru in the jungle. And we were at a research station about uh, 10 kilometers up the Tambo Pata River, which is a tributary to the Amazon. And at that research station, one of the things they studied were the macaws, the big, gigantic, colorful, colorful um, parrots. And um, we would get up real early in the morning while it was still dark, get in our dugouts, go to a sandbar on the river. Uh, at night, you could, if you, you shined your flashlight, you could see the reflections from the eyes of the caiman, the smaller alligators that were in the water. And we'd sit on the sandbar real quietly, and as the light came up, we'd see these macaws begin to circle overhead in pairs. And on one side of us was the river. On the other side of us would be a five or 600 um, vertical clay face. And all of a sudden, on cue, all the macaws would fly down and land on the side of this cliff and eat some of the clay. It was a big mystery. National Geographic did a whole spread on it one year. And then after the big birds left, the increasingly smaller parrots um, would, would fly in and do the same thing. And what was the purpose of these minerals and what was medicinal and what was nutritional and what was uh, uh, ectodermic in terms of on the surface of them and what went internal. Just very interesting to think about a lot of that. Silicone polymers. We live in an age that uses all kinds of polymers. We can even now look at um, some of the things that uh, have happened historically and begin to analyze and wonder what's going on here. What happened back then, now that we have better diagnostic tools? Here's a description of lead and Ludwig von Beethoven. I don't know if you heard the story that they went to uh, exhume his grade, grave, and when they dug him up, there he was, sitting at the bottom of his grave, just tearing up sheets of paper. He was decomposing. And there's where your little drum beat comes in, and we will move right along. And evidently, he was getting high levels of lead. And that probably uh, was very definitely responsible for his ill health. Uh, Roman soldiers, one of the con contributing factors to the decline of the Roman Empire was all of your wealthy people, the leaders, the movers and shakers of the empire, those who had financial means 
were the ones drinking the wine out of lead containers. And of course, lead pigments have a tendency to be sweet. And so the, lead, the, the wine would pick up a sweetness and sweets would be over, you would drink too much of it, but you were also getting high levels of lead. They would also have some plumbing and some lead um, pipes bringing water in, picking up the lead. Um, even as early as the 1950s, paint was lead-based. And in old houses, the paint would begin to peel off. And children, um, especially poor children, living in cheap homes that landlords did not maintain, would eat some of these pieces of lead paint peeling off the walls, fall into the floor, and find that they were sweet. Um, and as a result, they would get various neurological issues, uh, both nausea and abdominal pain, but also headaches and, and lethargy and, or hyperactivity would seem to go either way. And so if you were a child in school and you were showing this kind of stuff, oftentimes you would um, be assumed, people would jump to the conclusion that you're just, you know, not cut out for school or you're kind of dumb or, you know, something's wrong with you. And um, rather than looking for a medical diagnosis and reason. And sometimes whole groups and races of people get labeled incorrectly or categorized or prejudiced against because of the large number uh, of them that may have been exposed to some type of environmental condition such as this. And for those of you that have ever played with Silly Putty, here's another good example of a silicon-based polymer. Now we come to nitrogen. We're up to number five out of eight. And of course, our atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen has that triple bond, which makes it extremely stable, an essential feature for an atmosphere that has as much oxygen as we do. Nitrogen is also going to um, make tetrahedral structures, just like the element beneath it, phosphorus would make in the phosphate polyatomic um, poly, uh, ion. How do you get the nitrogen out of the atmosphere with that triple bond and turn it into compounds that plants can use? Well, you need nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the soil that can do that, and it happens all the time. Uh, it's a very essential part of the nitrogen cycle in the Earth's crust. There are so many cycles in the Earth's crust that are essential for life. It's no wonder you begin to think that this planet has been designed for us to be here. Here's another element with several allotropes, white phosphorus and red phosphorus, which is the kind of phosphorus that goes in big long chains. I've worked with both. Um, we don't keep it in the lab anymore. Phosphorus, especially white phosphorus, can blow up in contact with air. During the Vietnam War, I recall, sometimes some of the shrapnel from explosions would have white phosphorus in it, which would get inside the wounds of soldiers. And so as soon as doctors went to operate on these wounds and expose the white phosphorus, it would burst into flames. Uh, very insidious. But I also did some chemical demonstrations back in my daring days when I did all kinds of chemical demonstrations, some of which were rather dangerous. I'd get some white phosphorus, and, um, you, and you could rig it in such a way that um, when you wanted it to, it, be, it would be exposed to air, and it could burst into flames to the oohs and ahs of everybody around you that hopefully, if I think back, were wearing goggles at least. But you can make a match head out of this kind of stuff as well. Hydrazine, another important word. We already know about the importance of ammonia, but hydrazine, N2H4, kind of interesting. Um, it's a strong reducing agent, which means it's going to provide protons, it's going to provide um, hydrogen ions for other things so that they can be reduced. It's used in wastewater treatment. Because uh, it can, 
And um, it's also used as a rocket fuel. And if you've ever had an aquarium, you would appreciate the delicate balance here. Saltwater aquariums are much harder to maintain than freshwater ones. I used to have a lot of aquariums, but I don't have them anymore. We have to convert nitrogen in the atmosphere into nitrogen compounds for our fertilizers to augment what bacteria does naturally, and that's a challenging process, denitrification. Now we come to oxides of nitrogen, and there are a lot of them. If for no other reason, this is why you need the binary nomenclature, where you have your mono, di, tri, tetra. Remember, you don't use mono for the first word, um, it's like di-nitrogen monoxide and so forth. There are so many of these nitrogen oxide compounds. Sometimes they're just called NOx, sort of as a generic group referring to combinations of all of these. And dinitrogen monoxide is also known as laughing gas that dentists sometimes have used. Some of these nitrogen oxides are compounds in air pollution. It used to be the air pollution was due to unburned hydrocarbons and soot and sulfur. With our high, um, with our engines that burn at such high temperatures um, and are highly efficient, now you're able, even able to make nitrogen oxides, creating a different kind of smog and air pollution. How do they first make phosphorus? Look at this. How would you like to be the person who said, you know what I want to do with my life? I want to isolate phosphorus. I'm going to get 60 gallons of urine, and we're not going to think about where, in order to get a mere 30 grams of phosphorus over, after a lot of stinky work. We use some of these nitrogen oxides as propellants. We use nitric acid all the time for, as a precursor to all kinds of compounds that we make. So we make lots of nitric acid and we use lots of nitric acid. In fact, one of the ways that you can um, estimate or gauge how industrial a country is, is by how many thousands of tons of sulfuric acid and nitric acid they manufacture or use in their industries. And interestingly enough, nitrogen, um, nitric acid doesn't react with aluminum, but it does with copper. Here's the match heads, a mixture of phosphorus and sometimes sulfur, or sometimes potassium chlorate I used to make a mixture of phosphorus, uh, red phosphorus and potassium chlorate, and then I would hit it with a hammer and get a nice big bang, you know, uh, to, as a demonstration. And one time I was mixing the uh, red phosphorus and uh, the potassium chlorate, with a, and I was using a metal spoon, it's all I happened to have, on a piece of paper, and I don't know what happened, but it ignited before I even got a chance to hit it with a hammer, and I've got some scars on my thumb from that. And, and I just had to wince a little bit and pretend like nothing happened um, as I was doing these chemical demonstrations for an elementary school. All the different kinds of phosphate compounds, phosphorus oxoacids. Now we're up to the oxygen family. You're in biology, you're gonna learn an awful lot about photosynthesis. It's by far the most abundant element in the Earth's crust, about 50% by weight. They mention the word anaerobic. Do you see that right down here, formed by anaerobic? 
That's a word that means without oxygen. Aerobic exercise is, is light exercise with lots of movement and lots of breathing. Um, it's a good workout. And anaerobic is when maybe you're doing a marathon or you're in overtime in your competition and you are just totally exhausted. And then you kind of go into an anaerobic respiration and, and begin to build up some lactic acid and so forth in your muscles. You should know what ozone is, O3. Know that it's diamagnetic. It's got a bit of a blue color down here. Remember, you have paramagnetic and ferromagnetic, and this is diamagnetic. We should remember those terms. It's slightly magnetic. Um, and you wouldn't notice that so, except with liquid um, oxygen. Let's see if I remember that correctly. We have selenium here. Look at Marie Curie at the last paragraph on the page. Speaking of painstaking work, she took literally tons of a, a mineral called pitch blend to isolate uranium and other elements from it. <coughs> Hydrogen sulfide is that chemical that smells like rotten eggs. Terrible odor. If you have halitosis, bad breath, it might be from some of these sulfur compounds. Some, type, some people don't like broccoli or Brussels sprouts or kale or asparagus because they've got some sulfur compounds in them. But you can also get a lot of pretty colors. Here's the production of sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid. Please keep in mind, in order to make a strong acid, you have to also make another product that is e either going to be a precipitate or a gas or a product that has strong bonds in it. The halogens, group 7. Fluorescence, from the word to flow, having to, coming from the word flux, which was a fluorine compound used in metalworking. I've used flux before when I've done some soldering. I even used some flux when I made a Tiffany lamp years ago, and it had a, a, a lead material in between each of the colored panes of glass. We weren't as cautious about that as we should have been way back when. Fluorine is a powerful oxidizing agent. If you think about it, it's right next to oxygen, and oxygen obviously is an oxidizing agent. It was the original one, so you'd expect fluorine and chlorine and bromine to be good oxidizing agents. What does an oxidizing agent do? It's in something that helps something else to be oxidized. So therefore, in order to be oxidized, you need to provide um, a place for electrons. You need to be reduced to be a good oxidizing agent. And so you've got to have a place for one or two electrons to fill up your outer shell. Chlorine can come from the electrolysis of brine. We've talked about that before. We use salts as salt bridges, and we use salts as, as electrolytes to... Um, conduct electricity through solutions. Vocabulary word down with iodine, sublimed, to go straight from the uh, solid to the gaseous state. If you want to see something that's really ugly, look up the word goiter, which was a much more common affliction, especially of people that lived in the middle part of the country, away from the oceans. People that live near the oceans would have fish on a much more regular basis in their diet. And fish have, a, have natural levels of iodine. People living inland and have fish as much, and an iodine efficiency would affect your thyroid gland, and you get these big, gross, if you will, called goiters, very 
ugly looking. Um, and that can be treated with iodine. Now, you never see that anymore because almost all the salt that we use on a day-to-day basis is iodized salt, which is what the thyroid needs. Fluorine compounds, one unusual feature of fluorine um, is that it can etch glass. Even though it's a weak acid. Remember, fluorine is a weak acid. Students often forget that. It's an extremely small molecule. Maybe one of its principal uses is in uranium hexafluoride when we are trying to extract uranium-235 from uranium-238 using a centrifuge or um, a gaseous uh, diffusion. Hydrogen chloride is the name of the gas which, when bubbled through water, creates hydrochloric acid. Here's another important vocabulary word. Disproportionation. Disproportionation. Now, what it means is not what the word kind of looks like. You're supposed to kind of see the word proton in there a little bit. But if you look at the element chlorine and the sign oxidation numbers, chlorine gas, of course, it's zero on the left side. But on the right side, in the hypochlorite ion, the ClO minus, there your chlorine is a plus one. So chlorine goes from a zero to a plus one in the um, hypochlorite ion. But you also have the chloride ion as well. That's a minus one. So here you have two chlorines, both zero. One goes to a plus one. The other one goes to a minus one. So it's being both oxidized and reduced. Disproportionation. And this is the form of chlorine that we use to uh, keep a swimming pool clean, to disinfect it. Obviously, you wouldn't want to be carrying around tanks of chlorine gas because you'd probably lose a lot of people along the way. It would be a very dangerous job then. It's dangerous enough as it is. Now, remember what a perchlorate is. If chlorate is ClO3 minus, then perchlorate, which is short for hyperchlorate, is ClO4 minus. Per is short for hyper, and this is when you have one more oxygen than your eight, your chlorate, nitrate, sulfate, phosphate. When you have one more oxygen than that form, that's where you get that prefix per, short for hyper. And it is very explosive. It's almost a contact explosive, a little bit of disturbance, and it goes boom. So hopefully that's a review of a lot of chemistry for you.